this is very hard work to talk about. Um, I know very little about what it means while I'm making it, and it usually takes a long time after I've made it to, to digest what it means and, and even where it comes from. This is not the work I set out to make in my life. I was uh, trained as a portrait painter at the Rhode Island School of Design. And uh, that was many years ago. And getting from portraits to this was a, a series of long, slow evolutions, as well as a lot of little epiphanies that happened along the way. And there were a couple of really pivotal, pivot, pivotal epiphanies. <laughs> Um, that happened kind of early on that led to making this kind of work. You, you end up doing this stuff for so long with only your dog as your witness in the studio um, that you live in your own world and it makes perfect sense to you. Um, what you're doing is you're, you're forging a language, you're making a language of your own that's, that's uh, a language nobody else speaks. You only hope that that you can communicate through that language. But um, but I realized a couple things really early on. I, would, I went from RISD to Nantucket, and I uh, thought I was going to be the next John Singer Sargent. I loved his work. I loved uh, that late impressionism, uh, the the flurry of brush strokes, which are still kind of present in the work. Um, but I started to reject that at the same time. And um, one thing I was trying to do was to get better at painting. And I would go out in the landscape with a box of paints. And I realized that to get better at painting, you have to study light and nature. And so lots of trips out into the landscape with the paint box. And, um, and I began to realize, well, OK, painting a face is not unlike painting the side of a hill. It's how light is reflected and color is reflected. Um, and how to, to put colors next to one another to um, create space. That wasn't too unlike portrait painting. And then um, slowly, um, this, this happens that uh, I started to get more gestural, looser. And uh, you know, you see this happen with, with some artists that they make this transition from very tight to very loose. And it wasn't just about that. I think I was always kind of a gestural painter. But, um, but more and more, I just began to paint the light and the color and not necessarily attach the color to form. The, you know, the, the, the green didn't have to hang on a tree, but the green mark could be over there. Um, and so that was a little epiphany. And that happened out in, in the landscape of Nantucket. Um, and this was a period of time where I was um, painting in, in, uh, on weekends and uh, working in the studio at night and uh, building houses during the day to, to make ends meet. Um, and I finally wanted to really get better at my chops, so I decided to go to Italy and study, um, study Renaissance painting, study the old masters, go back and see the Caravaggios I'd studied at school and see them in, in, up close and in person. Uh, so I get to Rome, and um, Caravaggio was there, and of course, inspiring, but there were also some little Cezannes in the, the Modern Art Museum in Rome, as well as some Van Goghs. And of course, I'd seen pictures and seen Van Goghs in New York and Boston. But I don't know, the, the combination of knowing I was painting the landscape in Tuscany and thinking about those painters in the south of France, it wasn't unlike what I was doing. And, and so I was very inspired by them. So you see uh, Cezanne uh, comes back in a little collage element there. And Van Gogh is in a collage element there, torn up art um, And I realized that, that with Cezanne, he was, he was doing just that. He was painting with mark, with gesture, with movement, with, with space. Uh, but the, there was form and there was formlessness at the same time. You, you could tell there was a tree, but you didn't know where the edge of the tree was. You could tell where the house was, but you, you weren't quite sure where the geometry of the thing. It was all sort of twittering, like 
Greece was always cool. I, I love that. I was really inspired by that. And so uh, while studying Leonardo and Michelangelo, I was really looking at Cezanne <laughs> and, and Van Gogh, not doing what I was supposed to be doing. <laughs> and so I, I knew uh, while I was there in, uh, in Tuscany uh, that I needed to get up to Paris to see the, the great museums there. And it rained that whole spring I was in Tuscany. And so I was painting indoors. And, uh, and I was starting to work um, still landscapes, still these sort of gestural, loose landscapes. But now they're, they're invented. You know, I'd walk out in the, the, uh, the hillsides of these Tuscan towns, and then I'd come back in the studio, and I'd make the paintings that I couldn't make uh, outside. And so I was starting to work from some level of invention, some level of memory. Um, so I was a graduate student in Italy, and needing to get to Paris with no money, and I, I had my uh, girlfriend at the time on Nantucket open the studio doors one Saturday and <coughs> sell off whatever she could. This is an aside, so if I go too far <laughs> off track, let me know. But anyway, she sold four little paintings, I don't, tiny. I think I got $700 for them total, you know. Um, but it was just enough for somebody on a grad school budget <laughs> to get to get a train to go to Arles for a few days to see where Van Gogh uh, painted and to get to Paris, to get to the museums. To uh, I remember distinctly not eating lunches, but eating a, a couple of dinners, <laughs> staying in a flea bag motel, but seeing the, the great museums, the Musée d'Orsay. And, and just pure coincidence, I come out of this restaurant one day, and uh, um, so I'm a grad student, I had two changes of clothes for the six months that I was there. <laughs> I hadn't cut my hair, I had a beard, that, you know, very bohemian, I loved it. Um, and walking across the street is a couple, and he's got on an hat cat, you know, if, if you've been to Nantucket, you know the ACK uh, symbol for the Nantucket airport. It was the couple that bought the four paintings oh. that allowed me to get to Paris. Oh. <coughs> and uh, so anyway, uh, I saw those um, uh, paintings by Cezanne in the Louvre and uh, in Musée d'Orsay particularly. But I was another painter I was really interested in, and that was Joan Mitchell. Some some article I had seen somewhere uh, of her work. I don't know if you know her work, but she was a modernist painter from the from the fifties, friends with Pollock and Gustin and de Cunha. But she lived and worked in Paris most of it. I, I saw her work in pictures, and it was the marks of Monet that I knew and loved, and, and but it was something else. It was detached from the water lily but it was still nature. Um, they moved me uh, more than Cezanne. And there are three paintings in the Pompidou in uh, Paris by Miro. And there are these giant blue abstractions that he made, these murals that he made in the 60s, I think in 62 or 64. And they're nothing but a field of blue with this one kind of Miro-like line and some daubs of red and some daubs of black. And I didn't know what they were, um, but they were so beautiful. They were the scale of those Caravaggios I'd seen in Rome. But they were, I didn't know what they were. <laughs> Uh, and I still don't, uh, but I knew that it was, it was a direction that I wanted to find my way into. And so slowly, form starts to drop out of my work, the landscape starts to drop out of my work, and, and it becomes more abstract. And so you can think of abstraction as this kind of stylization, this journey from, from representation to something looser, but that's not quite right. Abstraction is also, you can also start with nothing but shape and color and line and mark and 
Um, and it can mean something, and it can represent something. It can become something. And that, to me, is language. And, and it is still light, it's still color, it's still mark, um, it's still gesture, it's still all those things that I had to know as a portrait painter. Um, but now it's, it's, um, it, it is, it's in a new place. It's re representing something different. It's, um, it is, becomes a language that only I can speak. And that's really how I start to think about it. And so, you know, fast forward 20 years of doing that and you get here. And so these paintings still come out of experience of landscape. Um, they come out of uh, experiences on, on Nantucket, um, but not just Nantucket, uh, any, anywhere where there's sea and sky and ocean, mountains, space, um, they, they come out of that experience. Uh, but they also are self-referential. I didn't realize this. This is a painting that is uh, uh, from 2005, I believe, and there are these uh, vertical little dashes. And there's a painting from uh, just not too long ago, last fall, it was gone. And there are those little dashes coming back <laughs> again. Um, there are those little oval shapes on the lower right corner with stems attached to them. And there they are uh, five years later. Um, and, and so the, some, I don't know where that came from, something I saw in the landscape. Uh, I could call it there, I called it a tulip there. It might be a cat of nine tail, but I really don't know. It might just be a squiggle. It might be something that my daughter was doing. You know, I have a six-year-old now, and, and the child's drawings are a big inspiration. Um, but you acquire these things, and they, and they appear and reappear and reappear. Uh, in your work, not as a, not as repetition, so much as vocabulary that they uh, um, are part of a, a part of my visual vocabulary, as it were. Mm -hmm.